All right, we got Dean in North Carolina. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good. Good to talk with you, Matt. Um, and what's the other gentleman's name? Shane. Shane. Yep. Yeah. Good to talk to you too. It one says it says here that what the what the call screen is written down is is you say manuscript evidence for the New Testament, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Why is it not accurate? Yeah. So <clears throat> my my point is um, what what I often hear is that we have copies of a copy of a copy from someone we don't know who's got a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And my question is, um, why, why do you think that the transmission of the New Testament is not accurate? I didn't, when did I say it wasn't accurate? What I'm saying is, I'm you, saying in, what, what I'm saying I'm is saying, that because we don't have originals, you can't say with any strong confidence how accurate it is to the original. Meanwhile, the Dead Sea Scrolls are irrelevant when you're talking about the New Testament. So I don't know why... I mean, you're aware that, that there aren't New Testament documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? No, no, I understand that. I was just giving the call screener a synopsis of saying, okay, I'm talking about the accuracy of manuscript evidence like the, like the Dead Sea Scrolls as an example, not that the Dead Sea Scrolls are the exact conversation I want to have. Is, well, it, is it that you're comparing the fact that people look at these scrolls and use them to account for the past. And you're saying that, like, if we can do that with the Dead Sea Scrolls, why don't we do that with the New Testament? Is that what you're asking? Uh, no, I was just using an example to the okay. call screener. What I'm asking, what I'm asking is, what, what, I, what the question I'm asking is, why would someone say, for instance, that, like Bart Ehrman, for instance, Bart Ehrman would say, you can't know what the New Testament actually says because they are riddled with manuscript errors. My question is twofold. Do you, would you say that that's the case? And two, if you say that that's the case, um, why, would, why does that, or why would you believe that, that they aren't accurate? Well, for starters, okay, so you're familiar with the telephone game, right? Yeah. Okay, so are you aware, and if I'm wrong about this, I'd like to be corrected, but... Are you aware that the first writings about Jesus were, uh, you know, the first writings of the New Testament were 50 years after he had already died? So, like, they were using oral traditions to tell the story for 50 years. Are you aware of that? Yeah. So okay, so for 50 years, nothing was written down. Everyone was just repeating the story. And you have said you know the telephone game. Would you agree with me that if we play the telephone game, the story is likely to get changed? I would say in the modern way that we play the telephone game, but not the game in the is designed. You, the game you, is designed. Okay, go ahead. It, it's not a game. Okay, are you suggesting that communication between humans in the past was somehow more likely to be accurate on details than modern humans? <clears throat> no. What I'm saying is that the preservation of what was transmitted then is different than the way the telephone game is played. The telephone game is essentially a bad analogy. But, uh, the, no, the, the point is, it's not, say, say analogy means two things are being compared due to their similarities. They're not saying these two things are identical. But he, here's, the, here's the quick summation. First of all, I don't know that Bart Ehrman would say what you think he would say. I think he, like a lot of other New Testament scholars, who I'm going to agree with, would say that what we have as a translation in modern Bibles is probably pretty accurate in most significant respects to what the originals likely said. However, we don't know what the originals said because we don't have them. And even if they were completely accurate to the originals, that has no bearing on whether or not what is in them is true. No, I, I agree with you there. My argument, my argument isn't uh, necessarily the historicity of the document. I'm questioning why someone would say that they're not accurate. And what I, what I then you should talk to someone who has said that and ask him why they say that. Yeah, well, I'm talking to Shane, and Shane saying that, you know, it's like the tell. It's similar to the telephone game. It is. And I've said, okay, so the telephone game though is designed 
for the message to be confused. Right. It, it, it's designed to illustrate the flaw in what you're doing or what you're referring to. It's illustrating the flaw in that method. So the that's the same happens. method, but it's just when we play the telephone game, we do it to illustrate that. Yeah. It, it, a telephone game is a way to put an, a punctuation mark or a shine a spotlight on problems in our communication. If you take 10 people who were at Woodstock and ask them to describe what happened, how much variation is there going to be in their story? Oh, I, I don't know. Well, right. it was 50 years ago. I mean, I was taught the telephone game when I was in elementary school. It was taught to me in school yeah. to demonstrate that this is an ineffective way to tell if something's true, if this is how it's been passed on. Mm -hmm. and it, and, but I understand. So it seems like you're agreeing with my criticism of the telephone game, but you're saying that this is different from that. Yeah, I would say that the, the telephone game, the way that it is set up, that is inherently flawed because it's designed for the message. Okay, so explain we're what, because we agree that it's flawed, okay. explain what the flaw is in that method. Gotcha. Okay, so the flaw in the telephone game is that, one, once the message is said, the person who has received the message cannot go back and ask the person who gave them the message, hey, could you clarify this, that, or the other? And, and you don't think that happens in reality? No, I, it's and not about what happens in reality. It's about... It's, and, that's, and that's the only thing that matters is what happens in reality. As as right. I'm, I'm trying to see the difference not, in a, a scenario where people are playing the tele telephone game and the first yeah. 50 years of this story being passed down. Like, I'm trying to see what the difference is to you because it's the same method of people just repeating the story. And it doesn't, gotcha. like, people don't have to be intentionally dishonest. Someone, Matt can tell me something yeah. and I can repeat it back to you. And if I misunderstood him, then I'm going to tell you something wrong. Or he was wrong. Right. Place, but. So I, I also think that there would be a difference. Let me finish the first point with the transmission and then we'll talk right. about what you said. Go for it. So the, the problem with the telephone game, as I said, you know, the person that receives the message can't go back and check. The rule is you can't go back and check to the other person. You can't ask the person who said it before you or the three people that passed the message before you, right. uh, hey, what did you say? Whereas with specifically the scribes copying down the manuscripts. No, 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 they, no, they no, no, no. Can you no. talk to the first person no. that relayed this story? We're talking about no. before there were manuscripts. Right. I, can you talk, because you're I, saying that the problem is you can't go back and talk to those people, and you're arguing for an example where that's exactly the case. No. You can't go back and talk to those people. I'm, I'm simply talking about first, the transmission of the scribes. Now, what you said is, all right, the people that originally talked about these types of stories in the New Testament. Now, the difference, I would say, is the difference between that and our culture is that given the roots of Christianity, there was a, there was a culture that was orally based. And what I mean by that is, at, by the age of 12, the Jewish uh, men or the teenagers, as we would call them today, were to memorize the Torah by heart, right? They could do that. So what you have in the preservation of these stories is you have a group of people who are already committed to being able to memorize large chunks of story. Okay, so you are making an argument. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is specifically, so no, stop. This is specifically what I asked about earlier, that you're saying... Okay that there was something fundamentally different about the way human beings uh, communicated in the past that made them more accurate with oral history. That's, that's what I was asking okay. about earlier. And it seems like that okay. something is that they did this more regularly, and you're talking about them using oral traditions more often. That's not because it was more effective. That's because they were illiterate. People who can't write are going to learn that way instead. But you, you don't get to go back and appeal to what you think happened that may have prefer, pre preserved accuracy, you have to actually provide evidence that the accuracy was preserved, which you can't do, because here's the thing. If Jesus gets up there and stands and gives the Sermon on the Mount, then there's a bunch of people out there who can relay that information. What's the likelihood that a chunk of people are going to get it word for word? Gotcha. Well, it's not a chunk of people. The closest people 
What's the likelihood that any one person standing there listening to the Sermon on the Mount is going to get it word for word right? Oh, I don't know. Um, I do. How many times Jesus gave the Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount? How, how many times? He, he didn't give it just once. No, the question. Yes, he did give it just once. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, but he could preach that sermon multiple times back. Obviously, you have no evidence of that. That's just a bullshit just pulled out of your butt. It's not. It is. It's not. It's, it's, it is. It's what rabbis did in the first century, Matt. That that's doesn't make it did. accurate well, it, to the I fact that that's what they did. It, it's well, Matt's saying that they only did it once, and I'm no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm fucking not. He said Stop. Jesus gave the sermon. Once. I said listen, you can't. Not gonna, listen, Matt, I respect you, dude. You're not going to cuss at me if you need to hang up. You need to hang up. Because you're not going to cuss at me like that. I will fucking cuss at whoever the fuck I want. And if you don't fucking like it, you can fucking hang up. How's that? Well, it so sounds, sounds grand, but, but this is too important for me to just hang up because you've got a potty mouth. So, so because you are worried about whether or not I use words that you like, you want me to hang up on you, but you won't hang it's up. It's just a matter of respect. Well, so you're the one that has no, to hang up and I'm, then... <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's a matter of respect here in that I'm trying to get to the point of something and point out where the flaw is, and you're sitting here just pulling stuff out of your butt saying, wow, he could have given I'm that not, sermon. You, you are. If you interrupt me again, I'm going to put you on hold, and then I will, I am, you're on hold now, and I will fucking curse at you as much as I fucking want while you stay on hold and fucking listen to it. I don't know why you're so worried about fucking words being problematic and saying I have a potty mouth. You know what I don't have? I don't have a brain that is going to make up excuses when the argument that I present is not rational. All I'm saying is that you want to claim, well, maybe Jesus gave this sermon many times, okay? But if you have an audience, what is the likelihood that someone is going to get it word for word correct? Pretty low. That happens all the time. You, you can't even probably, well, as is evidenced by the conversation, you can't even relay back to me what I said word for word or even get the actual encapsulated issue correctly because my issue is that you have no way to demonstrate that Jesus did, in fact, give the Sermon on the Mount multiple times. At most, you can come up with it as an ad hoc explanation for one possibility which you cannot demonstrate. All you can do is say, hey, Traveling rabbis may have given sermons many times over, and maybe Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount many times over. But there are other events within this narrative in the Bible which are single event occurrences, not, not multiple events. It's not like here's a sermon that could have been given multiple times. You are busy coming up with whatever excuse you can, just out of thin air. Every time I say, hey, What's the likelihood that somebody gave a sermon and people got it word for word right? Well, they didn't just have to give it once. How do you know? How do you know that it wasn't given just once? You have no way of demonstrating that. We have no original manuscripts. So you want to look at how likely it was that they copied it accurately. And I've already conceded, as would many New Testament scholars, that they very likely copied it accurately. And not 100% accurately. We know there are variations in manuscripts. We can look at that. There's actual evidence. And Shane brought up that the first writings were anywhere from 30 to 50 years afterwards, or at least decades afterwards, and wanted to talk about that oral history and how it was transferred, which is why I asked you a question about, are you appealing to people being different back then? And you said no. And then what did you do? You appealed to people being different back then. Oh, well, they had to learn this stuff. None of this gets to what was actually originally said. You have no way of demonstrating it. And here's the rub. If, in fact, anything about the story is true, or the, the key elements of the story is true, then there is a God who has an important message for humankind and chooses to reveal it in such a way that future generations cannot be confident that it is accurate and instead have to come up with post hoc rationalizations and bullshit claims about, oh, well, maybe it was this, well, maybe it was this, well, maybe it was this. Why can't God, the governor of the universe, the creator of everything, the all-powerful, all-knowing being communicate in a way where you and I would never have to have a conversation about how accurate is this book to the original. 
Okay, so which which part of that diet trap do you want me to address? I don't know. Just pick <laughs> okay. one. So, so, so it's not. I, I would I would reject the notion that I'm simply pulling this possibility out of thin air, given that even New Testament scholars like Bart Ehrman, like uh, Craig Evans, like Mike Lacona, who you've debated, Matt. Yes, I've debated Mike Lacona, and Mike Lacona stood up and talked about Ouija boards and trash can lids in a yeah. debate about the resurrection. Don't, don't reference him as if he's some icon of reasoned argument, because he's not. It was garbage. <laughs> okay, but New Testament scholars would certainly agree that as you look into the, histo the history of the time of the first century and the process of which itinerant rabbi preachers operated, that they simply didn't give one sermon one time. It was kind of like a stump speech, right? So you have candidates that go around from place to place. They give the same you thing. You are completely... Same thing, take, same thing takes place. No, nope. uh, nope. sorry, you're on hold again. Let me, be, let me try to be more clear. I'm not saying it didn't... It isn't, I'm not saying Jesus didn't give this speech more than once. I'm saying you have no way to show that he did give it more than once. And that means that it is a post hoc thing. You can say, hey, it could have been like a stump speech. Okay, it could have been. How do you demonstrate that it was? Because until you can demonstrate that it was, you don't get to use that to claim that what we have is accurate. Okay, so, so in appealing to the historical context and the historical probability, that that's what happened. You would say that that's not enough to, to, to posit that it's probably true that Jesus gave these sermons more than once. Is Correct. A fair question. Correct. Okay. And by the way, as okay. I pointed out in the diatribe, the part that you skipped right over to address the th the part that you thought you could, there are single instance events: the wedding at Cana. That he didn't do the wedding at Cana multiple times, did he? Was he a wedding magician? No, we're, okay, we're, we're, so we're, so the facts of that being reported. His speeches. We're talking about his speeches. Is what we were talking about. So you mentioned if you pull up a red letter Bible, if you pull up a red letter Bible, how many of those do you think are something that he gave multiple times? If I pulled up a red letter Bible, as far as the speech sections, I think he gave, I would say he probably gave the Sermon on the Mount at least I didn't once. say, I, oh my God, it's like, it's like your brain will not let you address the question that you're asked. If you pull up a red letter Bible, for those who aren't familiar, a red letter Bible is one when you go through the New Testament, highlights the words that are supposedly actually spoken by Jesus in red. What percentage of those red letters, which are supposedly direct quotes, are parts of speeches that you think he gave multiple times? I would say, I would say that the multiple occasions are those in which he takes place, takes place either uh, like Sermon on Mount Hillside gatherings. I would say instances where he is cleansing the temple. Dean, take place once Dean, are you capable of once. listening to a question and answering the question you were asked? Because you're not. Yeah, I, I actually am. No, you, no, you actually fucking aren't. I'm saying. It's a compliment there too. What percentage of red letter words attributed to Jesus do you think are part of speeches that he gave multiple times? That's what I said. Not which yeah. speeches. What percentage of the red letter? Well, you would you would have to pare that down because each section of the red letter takes place in a different context. Jesus fucking Christ. I'm, I'm just being straight. That's how you... No, you're not being straight. This is a simple, <laughs> simple question that is, allows the conversation to move forward instead of putting up the roadblocks and hand-waving that you're doing. I'm not putting up what? the roadblocks. Yes, I'm you are. <laughs> what percentage of red letters in, in the New Testament would you estimate are part of speeches that Jesus gave multiple times? I, I don't know because of the... You should go learn. ...the speeches took place. But you got an honest answer at the end there. So, uh, going to give credit where credit's due. <laughs> that, Sometimes, that, is, that is, yeah. Sometimes the correct answer is, I don't know. And when you don't, don't come in acting like you do. That's all I'm saying. Well, it's, it's not an issue of, 
not not being able to know. It's an issue of what's the context of the speech being given. No, it's not. That's the point. Okay. So it's not. Obviously. If if you acknowledge that let's say you let's say you think ten percent is something that are single occurrence events. At least you would have given me a number of what your estimate was. And then I would have said, okay, that means 10% of what is red letter was a single occurrence, which does not fit your preferred model of transition for accuracy. And so what likelihood is there that that portion, that 10% portion is accurate? And then we would have had to acknowledge that we can't be particularly confident in that 10%. I think it's much more, I think it's overwhelmingly single instance things. We're talking about a, a, a biography uh, of someone's purported life. And even if you, you, you know, this is why if you go to the Sermon on the Mount and you want to claim that, oh, he gave this sermon multiple times, well, you don't have any evidence for that. But even if I grant you that, that does not tell us how accurate it is. Because there are politicians now that can run around and give stump speeches and people don't give it accurate. And literally in this conversation, I have been asking very specific questions which you have failed to even approach an answer that would be consistent with the question. So either you're not listening, I am the world's worst communicator, or there's something else going on that shows that when you listen to something, even if I repeat it, that does not necessarily mean that you're going to get it correct. Okay, so in, in this conversation, the only thing that I've tried to lay out is the following. One, that the New Testament has been accurately transmitted. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that what's in it is historical. Second, I'm simply saying with regards to Shane's objection with the 50-year gap, that this, these things could have been preserved through oral tradition, given the nature of the culture of that time. That's when we got off into Jesus' dumb speech or, or whatnot. And that's when you started My, saying that it was somehow more effective for them to use the same method. You were saying it was people doing the same thing. You're just saying they were better at it back then. That and that's why Matt asked you, do you think there was something different in the way people were communicating to one another verbally at that time than they are gotcha. now? It's that's, also... That's where oral it, tradition... No, it's also okay. flawed. This is, this, is the, this is the thing. When you make those appeals to oral tradition, when you talk about by the age of 12, there were um, young Jews who knew the Torah verbatim. That's because the Torah was written down and they spent time in school learning it verbatim or in, in, in temple learning it verbatim. That is not the same as hearing a speech and getting it right, or even hearing it multiple times. Because even if Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount multiple times, that doesn't mean that there was somebody necessarily there who was going to hear it multiple times. And it's not the same as, here it is written down, let me read it to you, let me go through this, even if you're illiterate, I will teach you this. We'll go through it until you can recite it. Teaching someone by going through something that's written down until they can give it back to you verbatim is fundamentally different from I'm going to give my speech a few times and hope that you guys manage to get it correct. And I, I'm gotcha. sorry to like have to point this out, but this I think is going to help illustrate my point. You're familiar with, with um, the verse Exodus 20:13, right? I mean, if you don't yeah. know which one, okay, yeah. Thou shall not kill in the King James Version. Okay. Right. Do you know what it says in the New King James Version? Same verse. Murder. Right, it says, no, but it says, right, it says, you shall not murder. So let's stop and think about that. Do the word kill and the word murder mean the same thing? No, they don't. Right. So one of them could be wrong because one of them is saying don't kill, which is don't kill in, under any circumstance, self-defense, go to war, etc. But then the other one says you shall not murder. Well, murder is just the unlawful or some would argue the unjustified killing of another person by another. So we're reading the same book in the same language, but two different translations in the same language, you get a different meaning from the same verse. No, that's, I, I think that what you're bringing up as far as biblical translations is, is, a, is, a, is a valid uh, 
uh, objection. Okay, yes, well, thank you. I, well, I what I'm agree. saying is that that objection applies even more so when it's not being written down. Because at least when we when we look at the different English translations, like Shane's got one that says kill, I've got one that says murder. How do we resolve what is likely to be the original intent? Well, we would go back and look at the original Hebrew that it was written in. Mm -hmm and look at Hebrew dictionaries and talk to experts in the Hebrew language. And the best they can do right now is give us what modern Hebrew, how that would be interpreted, and what they believe was probably right. intended in ancient Hebrew. Yeah, do some research but, on the love thy neighbor, on the, the Hebrew meaning of that. But they can, they can go back to this and say, look, in the oldest and best manuscripts that we have, given what we understand about the time, this almost certainly meant murder. As, as opposed to kill. Mm -hmm. But that's, no, that is a pathway to resolving a potential conflict to get to what the original meaning probably meant yeah. that all of us are fine with. That does not exist when you don't have the originals, when you, don't, when you have that gap where they're telling stories. And this is why you're, you and others are going to say, well, Maybe he gave the Sermon on the Mount many, many times, and that increases the likelihood that somebody got it right. That, that is a post hoc rationalization that we don't have evidence for. I'm not saying it's impossible that it happened. I'm saying that this is presented in the Bible contextually, and, and I'll go back and do more research on this as well, but it's presented as a one-time incident. There's no indication in the Bible that Jesus gave this sermon multiple times it is presented as, to, as a specific, to a specific audience. Now, okay. I, I can't show that he didn't give it multiple times, but we can be relatively confident that a good chunk of what's in there that supposedly came from him wasn't given multiple times. And the things that aren't in red letters aren't even supposed to be quotes. They're just people trying to portray the ideas as accurately as they can. And so at the end, as I noted earlier, I'm going to agree that even modern English translations of the Bible are probably mostly accurate to our best approximation of originals. Um, however, we can't demonstrate where the inaccuracies might be, and it could be something as simple as a no that inverts a meaning, or it just might be mm -hmm. something that's largely irrelevant. And none of that fucking matters, because what matters is, is it true? Because Muslims can point back and say, hey, we have a completely accurate copy of the Quran because we have essentially the originals or we have, mm -hmm. you know, a shorter gap between the originals and the first written ones and less variation among our manuscripts. And so when they make that argument and the, the Muslims say, look, our holy book, we have far more confidence that it is more accurate to the original than anything available in Christianity or Judaism. Well, then the response to that is, yes, but your religion's newer or whatever else. But at the end of the day, the real question is the one I asked earlier. How does it make sense that there is a God who, knowing that these problems are going to happen, knowing that languages are going to change, knowing that languages are going to die out, knowing, knowing that the Muslims are going to come along with their false doctrine and claim that it's more accurate to the original, and that, you know, you and I are going to be having a telephone conversation uh, where, you know, you're arguing for a point that I find absolutely irrelevant in the grander scheme. How is it that God doesn't fix this? That is the portion that is absolutely absurd to think that there's a God that has an important message for everybody and there's no guarantee that the message is right, that the message is from him, that he doesn't seem to do anything to clarify disagreements, which is why you end up with thousands upon thousands of different denominations all within Christianity. Right. So, no, I think that that is a significant question that you raised, Matt, with regards to um, the preservation or the passing down of, a, of an important message. And I think that, you know, one of the things, one of the ways that it could potentially be answered, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that this is the answer, but it, I don't know if it, it follows, and I'm not accusing you of saying this, but I don't know that it follows that just because you have a perfect God that you would have to have um, something that has been preserved perfectly it could just simply be preserved sufficiently for what we need. And with regards to the multiple denominations... How, how can it be sufficient that, if people are getting it wrong? 
How can it be sufficient? Right. How can and it be are, sufficient if Christians are debating soteriology? And are are you conceding yeah. that it's not the perfect word? That like we don't have access no, to a I'm, perfect translation? What's there is sufficient, but with regards to sufficient but not perfect variants with variants and things like that, I'm I'm saying that it could be preserved in a sufficient manner, even though people who copy it or people who um, you know form multiple denominations that might be imperfect. But so, right. how, how can it be? How can it be sufficient if there's disagreement? Yeah, soteriology right. uh, is the, the, the study of what one must do to be saved. That is not agreed upon yeah. among different Christian denominations. They will point to right. different parts of the book. So how could you possibly argue that the book is sufficient to its goal, if the goal is salvation, if there is still disagreement among honest, well-intentioned Bible scholars about what the book's position is? Right. So that that has to do not necessarily with the book that probably more, that more has to do with the free will of the people who are seeking to seeking to um uh that, that has to do with free will choices that man use when they come to the book for instance no you could have no, somebody no the bible says, no no. Yes, 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 yes. You can sit no. and say no. I'm saying no to try to get you to shut the fuck up so I can explain why this was wrong. God, okay, so free will, if God, free will with regards to somebody, God cannot be, what they're gonna follow. Uh, okay, your ass is on hold again. You don't get to put the blame on humans because God is responsible for that as well. If God has a message and wants to convey it in a way that is sufficient instead of, you know, accurate, which is what would be really nice, but is sufficient, you don't get to say the message is sufficient, but these human beings got it wrong because of their free will. If that's the case, then the message isn't sufficient because we're talking about well-intentioned, honest people who want to seek God and want to know what God wants to say about salvation. If that is the problem, you don't get to put the blame on the human beings and claim that God did something that is sufficient because I could do something better than what God did that would actually convey what my thoughts are to every human being, and that might still be insufficient, but at least I could do that. So essentially what you're saying then is people are not, people are not responsible for the free will actions that they take towards no. interpreting. First of all, that's not even so, in the so fucking for, ballpark of what I yeah, just that, said. That's that, completely okay. separate from what he that said. And you're said. also, I should point said. out that exactly. you're. That's what you said. No, that no. is not what the fuck he said. I, I'm going to okay, put your ass back on hold and let Shane okay. explain to you what I said. Th I'm this done. is what he's going through. And I think I could help illustrate with this with an analogy. He was talking about why someone who wanted people to understand this would choose this method to do it. And I'd like to ask you a question, and I want you to just consider this analogy that I'm gonna give you and give me your answer. If you were a teacher, you worked at a school, and one of the teachers who, this is your coworker, was teaching a class by selecting four students, maybe five students, giving them the lesson, and telling them, you go teach the rest of the class. Would you criticize that teacher for using that method to teach algebra, or, would you consider it equally as efficient as teaching the whole class? That's, that's what Matt was trying to illustrate to you. Okay, so, so then, the, then what, what you're saying then is it's not the, you can't lay the blame of the, on the person for their use of free will. It's not for the not use of free will, no, because you're set, you're, he's talking about us being flawed beings, but who made us flawed? Who made it the case that right. we couldn't fully understand this? Right. So once again, right. Still, and so we didn't. It's not about free will, and I I don't believe in free will, but I don't think that free will is in the same ballpark as what we're talking about here. We're talking about the ability to understand this message efficiently. Even if so, let's let's play a hypothetical. God gives a perfect, inerrant word. He also endows people with free will. Are there people that would take that book and manipulate the book so that they might gain? Certain, certain authority. Thanks for okay. my part. Okay, first of all, again, you're not addressing the question that's being asked. And I'll, I'll, regardless of that, I'll answer your question. Yes, people probably would do that. 
However, okay. that's not what we were talking about, and we're not going to change the subject to that. What we were talking about was this being the method used to understand it. You're saying God wants everyone to understand this. That's your belief, right? God wants everyone to accurately understand this. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But he chose a way which is insufficient. I would, I would disagree that it's insufficient. Okay. But you disagreed with my criticism of the telephone game, and you accurately answered when I asked you what was wrong with the telephone game. And what I'm saying is you got the answer right, but the answer applies to this too. See, the question was, how can it possibly be sufficient if there are two honest, devout, sincere individuals who want to know what God thinks, who read the book and don't agree? Because a person doesn't have to intentionally mis uh, misinterpret it. Like, somebody doesn't have to intentionally say that the Bible says something it doesn't say, you know, translate it inaccurately. A person can mean to do it honestly and make errors. And if the, if the tool for communication to those two individuals is ambiguous or subject to uh, interpretation and misunderstandings among even honest people, how could you ever say that it is sufficient to the task that you set it to? Well, you could set that it's sufficient to the task that it's set to, even if you had honest individuals. No, who disagree you about. can't okay. because we've star started with, Is it just the we've MO? started with, the we've started with, we've start. I'm, I swear I'll just drop you. Then we, just drop me then. Do what you got to do. I don't care. I will, you little punk ass, but I'm going to, because I know you Thanks. won't hang up, I'm going to put you on hold and make you listen. Now I own you. You're on hold. The purpose, as acknowledged, was for God to communicate to everyone. You already acknowledge that. Oh, he hung up. Sorry. You already acknowledged that the purpose was for God to communicate this message to everyone. Okay? That's, that's step one. God wants to communicate to everyone. That is the task. The only way the message is sufficient to the task is if the message is clear enough that everyone can understand it. After that, you can get to willful disregard. You can get to willful changes. But you cannot take two people who, like, if, they're, if, if Shane and I are studying a, a book on uh, music theory, and we look at it, and we both really want to understand music theory, and we have the same text, and we look at it, and we come to two dramatically different understandings about it. Which has happened with us with interpretations of the Bible. There are verses that we, we disagree on what they mean. Yeah. But we're reading the same, not only the same book, the same translation. And so if that's the case, then you could say one of us is just not very bright or very wrong. But you can't say that it's an exercise of free will that one of us is intentionally trying not to understand it. Right. But if there's a God and that God is capable of making both of us understand this correctly, and instead of taking the method that is sufficient to ensure an accurate understanding for each of us, instead uses a demonstrably inferior method such that we don't come to a correct understanding, it ain't our fault. If you write a book that's not good enough for the, for the very thing that you're trying to teach, that's your fault. And if you make an argument that is insufficient to demonstrate your case, that's your fault. And back to my teacher analogy, if a teacher gives a lesson and every student in the class gets a different interpretation of it, you blame the teacher. Yeah. So. But the, the other thing about his analogy that's great that fits in there is, yeah, if you were to teach four of the students and have them instruct everybody else, that's a lazy fucking teacher. Right. That is somebody who's not doing their job. And if, 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 you, if one, of the, you know, like one of the four students taught another person and they understood it, cool. We're not saying you can't do that. Right. Maybe everybody in the class could understand, but it's clear that we have an issue where not, not even the four people necessarily agree and the rest of the class doesn't come to the same understanding. And you're going to say, it's that class. 
Yeah, and it's if, their free will. And if they start killing each other over who got the right answer, then I think it's the teacher who should be held responsible. Absolutely. So. All right. So that was a really long call. 